countless words and music out of the sky is a familiar part of everyday America. Yet its entertaining hours represent one of the most astounding achievements of art and science that the world has ever known. And we are going on a 10 minute journey to the place where the words and music begin. Forty seconds, Vic. Uh, Clary, let's get a final check on the mics. John Charles, let's check your mic, please. This is John Charles Thomas. That's okay, that's good. John Nesbitt, your mic, please. Once upon a time, it seems that there were two Irishmen, neither of whom were named Mike, which you'll be glad to know. That's okay, that's good, thanks. Chimes are on the nose. Stand by. Let us suppose that for 60 seconds we could stop the clock and take a glance at the unknown people behind a radio broadcast. Actually, the services of 834 men and women are employed to broadcast this program alone. It works out this way. Across the United States, 254 men are employed in 127 NBC stations just to guard and adjust the controls that coordinate and regulate this broadcast. And between these stations, there stretches a network of telephone wires that requires more than 500 persons to supervise and control. In Hollywood and New York, a special record of every note, every word will be made by these skilled technicians, while this small army of men across the country act out their hidden roles in one of the world's most remarkable new professions, which is the art of sending music through the sky. All of which brings us back to our radio station just 10 seconds before the broadcast. Westinghouse presents John Nesbitt, radio's gifted storyteller, Victor Young and the orchestra, Ken Darby and the Westinghouse chorus, and America's beloved baritone, John Charles Thomas. Charles Thomas on the Westinghouse program. Many of you have asked for a simple and familiar song today, so I'm going to sing for you one of the greatest ever written, In the Gloaming.
It's time for John Nesbitt and another of his adventures from his passing parade. Our Westinghouse storyteller, John Nesbitt. Do you ever find yourself, as you look at the flaming headlines of your Sunday newspaper, thinking of the way things used to be in the good old days, the good old days of a peaceful, lazy, sleepy kind of Sunday back in about 1910? Yes, a Sunday in June, 1910. It was cool and quiet in the front parlor, wasn't it? And the front parlor, you'll remember, was just as stiff and formal as we could possibly make it. The red plush armchair and the horsehair sofa and the fancy imported wallpaper behind them. That big globe lamp over there came from the mail order house, Little Daisy, model number 20. Of course, it didn't give much light, but then it had been a wedding present from grandmother, and we were mentioned in the will. The Dresden figures there came from Aunt Betty Jane. She's the one who married the rich foreigner and got a honeymoon abroad. And this we call the bric-a-brac collection. And above it, mother's marriage certificate. In holy matrimony, Emma Lou Huffman and James Harrison MacArthur, June 1st, 1891. The cuckoo clock was broken when I took it apart and got a licking. And why is it that we always insisted that the mantel be loaded down like a drugstore counter? There had to be a golden oak table someplace in the room to hold the family Bible in all its glory. The fancy glass feet you'll see underneath we considered very elegant indeed. And then, of course, there was the pillow that your high school sweetheart embroidered with the cute rhyme that she copied from Munsey's magazine. The talking machine played Rock of Ages on Sundays and Uncle Josh records the rest of the time. All the sentiment that clung to the crowded walls looks a little funny now, like the old upright where you had to practice an hour each day. But it represented the pride of a people who worked hard to bring to their homes the best the world had to offer. Dim and cool and distant now, the parlor of a Sunday in June, 1910. Yes, Sunday in June, 1910. And it was, after all, a pretty good time in which to be alive. And yet, it probably looks just a little better than it was, as we see it through the hazy summer sunlight of the years. And so, as we remember that, let us not forget today, when our soldiers fight to bring us back what was really good in those good old days, and also the scientist and the engineer toiling to bring to us what is really good in the great new days ahead. Thank you, John Nesbitt. And now we'll try something else that so many of you have requested. 
Victor Young's arrangement of Camp Town Races. a greatly beloved hymn. The familiar words offer a beacon of hope in a weary world. Our Westinghouse chorus will join me in singing, Come Thou Almighty King. Ken Darby, Victor Young, John Nesbitt and me to invite you on behalf of the entire Westinghouse organization to be with us again at this same time next Sunday. So until then, this is John Charles Thomas saying goodbye to you all. Thank <laughs> you.